Prince George's County Public Schools counts down to college. Hello and welcome to Countdown to College. I'm Robin Breeden. We believe that every student who wants to attend college should be able to do so. And to make sure that that happens, with us today on Countdown to College, making sure that your young person, your student, will be able to attend college in the fall is Terry Hamlin. She's back with us from last year. And Terry is the coordinating supervisor for counseling services with Prince George's County Public Schools. And a show would not be a show without having a parent on with us discussing her victories, triumphs, defeats, challenges. <laughs> challenges, all of that. Stephanie Ireland is with us, and Stephanie has a senior at Charles Herbert Flowers High School. To make sure that young people truly understand what colleges are looking for, we have with us Brian Leak. And Brian is the assistant, senior assistant director for admissions with Towson University. Everybody, welcome to Countdown to College. This is so, so, so important. And what Countdown to College really is for parents, it is a month-by-month -month calendar of things to do to make sure that your student and you have all of the paperwork in and that you're doing everything that you need to do to make sure that come fall, you are in college. Let's start with you, yes, Terry. Robin. You know, um, already, you know, but let's start it really from September, October. What should happen in September and October for young people? Well, in September, students should have identified between three to five colleges that they would be interested in, something that matches with their interests as well as what careers they may be looking um, towards going into. They should begin to um, identify these colleges, investigate, um, look online, find information about these colleges. Also look at the registration information, when applications are due, um, begin to narrow down what colleges they're really seriously um, thinking about attending. Now, and when we're looking at these five colleges, and I'm going to talk to Stephanie. Stephanie, and looking at the five colleges, so I'm assuming that your daughter has already done that. Yes, we've identified a little more than five colleges she's interested in. How did she pick those five colleges? Did she say, my first college is, this is going to be the one that I really want to go to, mm -hmm. and, and that's my first two, but my middle two will be ones that I, it'll be okay, and the, f the fifth one is really like a short shot, a long shot. How did you decide? Well, I have a child who's kind of between majors. She hasn't finalized what major she wants. So what we looked at, we looked at the schools that have the major that, the first two majors that she's really interested in, and one of the criteria was that the schools had to offer both, so that if she gets to a point where she changes her mind, she doesn't have to change schools. Mm -hmm. So we looked for comprehensive universities. Um, she's interested in journalism, and she's interested in computer science. So we targeted schools that had both of those programs. Now, were some of these schools Ivy League? League schools, where some of these schools, um, middle range schools, because um, let's talk about what schools require, what universities okay. and colleges are looking for, Brian. You know, some schools require higher SAT scores and, and higher grades. Correct. Um, most schools now are looking at your GPA 9 through 11. They're looking at all three years of high school to see if you're eligible for admission. Not, not 12th? Not 12th. 12th grade is taken into consideration when a student is considered to be borderline. You're quite not there yet, but you have the potential to be there with your first quarter, maybe second quarter grades. Also the SATs, they're looking at all three sections, critical reading, math, and writing, whereas before it was critical reading and math, or what was referred to as the verbal, which is now the critical reading portion. Um, most schools are transitioning to the point where they want all three sections of the SAT instead of the two previous sections. Now before the three sections, before the essay section um, started with the SAT, Everybody was talking about, oh, you got to get at least over a thousand. That's just to be okay. And they were shooting for the twelve and the thirteen hundreds. What's the score now with all three sections? Everybody's confused about that because the total score now is a twenty-four hundred, right? Actually, Robin, it depends on the school that you're applying to. Whereas some schools, such as Towson, their average is sixteen hundred. A school such as University of Maryland Eastern Shore, their average may not be as high as ours. Mm -hmm. And then you have some schools that are more competitive than Towson, and they want you to have a higher SAT. Okay, now in Ivy League schools, what I mean, what's considered to be all, oh, you know, the perfect would be twenty four hundred, right? Yes. But what's considered now to be, oh, you did well on the SAT. What kind of score? Sixteen would to eighteen hundred. Okay, sixteen to eighteen hundred is you um, did really well. Yes. 
How many times, and let's talk about that, how important mm -hmm. is that SAT, Terry? How important is it? Well, the SAT is very important, and we want to make sure that students study for the SAT and prepare before they take the test because it is an important test. Um, it is very important, so we want to make sure that they study. And around October, they should begin looking at the deadlines and when they can begin to take this SAT. And you should take the SAT and the more a than once. once. Once, correct. And take the ACT as well. Okay, and talk about the ACT. They look at the ACT and the SAT, but when we identified some of the schools, they were requesting or they were asking if she had taken the ACT, so we went back and made sure we took that as well. And she took it twice, and the SAT she took three times. And it got better each time? Yes. And what people really need to know, and let's, let's emphasize that again, like we always do, they always take the highest score, right? They always take the highest score generally, but there are some exceptions to that rule as with every rule that you have. Majority of schools will take your highest critical reading, your highest math, and your highest verbal, no matter how many times you take the test. But there are other schools that will only take your most recent score. Really? So if your score was a 2400 and it dropped to a 2000, you're stuck with the 2000. Mm -hmm. So you always have to communicate with the school that you're interested in their policies of admission. So meaning if you get a very high score, you know, the first time around or whatever, and you know that that school is only going to take the most recent score, don't have it sent to them again. Well, that would probably be safe. Yeah, don't have that sent to them again. So what is Towson looking for? What are you looking for? The average GPA is a 3.5. The average SAT is a 1600. Those are averages. We go above and below. Um, generally, if a student has a strong B average all three years of high school, a B plus average at 3.2, 3.3, maybe a 1400, 1500 on the SAT, they're safe. Now everybody's not going to have that. So Terry, what advice are, are we giving to, you know, because we're saying that everybody ha can go to college if they want to go to college. So I can't get into Towson, you know, I don't have um, the straight A's, the straight B's, I don't have the 1600, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? You can also go to the community colleges. The community colleges don't require the SAT test, but there is a placement test that they would have uh, a student take, and that is a very good option. They can take all the general courses first at the um, community college and then transfer in to a four-year college. We had the opportunity, and it was just so awesome, we had the opportunity um, to go one-on-one -on -one with president of Prince George's Community College, Dr. Charlene Dukes. And we're going to take a look at that interview right now. And coming up later in the show, we're also going to talk to a student who graduated from Prince George's Community College, uh, from Prince George's uh, County Public Schools, and then she went on to Prince George's Community College. But right now, let's talk to Dr. Dukes. We are the college here in the county, the one that is the, the county has a responsibility for K through 14, which includes Prince George's Community College. We're an institution that is solely focused on teaching and helping our students realize their potential, whether that is moving directly from an associate degree into the world of work or from an associate degree to a four-year institution where they can continue their academic work and success towards achieving the bachelor's degree. What, is the, what are some of the programs that you offer here? Well, we offer more than 100 programs of study on the academic side of the house, as well as another uh, probably more than 100 programs on our workforce development and continuing education uh, side of uh, Prince George's Community College. Some of those programs include things like general studies, where you can have a, a number of different foci, whether it's um, English, journalism, communications, pre-law, television, film, studio, theater. We also are looking at things like biology, history, s philosophy, psychology, sociology. So there are a number of programs that are designed for students really to come here for two years and then leave this institution with a certificate or an associate degree. Again, enter the world of work or move into one of the 
thousands of colleges with whom we have relationships, and we call those articulation agreements. Our students generally will stay here in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, and our, uh, those most popular transfer institutions for us are the University of Maryland College Park, the University of Maryland University College, Bowie State University, Towson University, Howard University, and we could go on and on and on. Our students are going to both four-year publics and four-year privates, American University, Georgetown, Catholic, St. Mary's College, Goucher, so that uh, Frostburg, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, so you name it, we have students at those institutions. One thing that I learned as a parent who has a child who started in community college is that you can actually major, have a major, come out with an associate's degree in a two-year college as opposed to in a four-year college most people think well, all you're taking is your English and your math and your basic courses. So yes. is that what happens here, or do they still have to take the SATs and, and do all of that? Well, you know, community colleges are open enrollment institutions, so we don't require the SAT or the ACT when you're first looking at applying to the institution. We provide students with the opportunity to take what we call a placement test. And that test, just like any other college or university you go to, whether it's two-year or four-year, will determine what your strengths are and then we will place you into courses based upon those strengths so that uh, a person can be coming immediately from high school or they can have been out of high school for some period of time and still want to pursue that dream of higher education and we make it possible for them. We serve more than 38,000 students today, mm. uh, the majority of whom are residents of Prince George's County. We serve a approximately 50 percent of the college-going population from the Prince George's County Public Schools. Uh, this year we had an 8 percent increase increase in our first time student enrollment and most of those students are coming to us directly from high school. That placement test, that placement test is not to eliminate who can get in. Isn't that placement test more of let me see what you need. True. The placement test is really just a determination of what your skills and capabilities are academically. So that test is provided in English, mathematics and reading and your score on the placement test will determine where you start at Prince George's Community College. What about tuition? Uh, tuition that's the good news. Oh, that's the good news. We are the lowest cost institution in Prince George's County. Uh, our tuition is about ninety four dollars per credit mm -hmm. and a full-time student will take anywhere from twelve to fourteen credits so when you look at tuition and fees and there are always fees a student activities fee and instructional services fee our students will pay about a hundred and twenty seven dollars per credit to come here to Prince George's Community College so uh, we believe that it's a uh, great investment that one can make in his or her education. And parents should understand that in this day of uh, day and age of consumerism and wanting certainly to make sure that you are spending your dollars wisely, we believe that Prince George's Community College is a wise choice. And in, in addition to that, certainly students are eligible for financial aid. They need to complete the FAFSA, the Free uh, Federal Aid application, as well as the state aid application. And uh, those the information that, that parents and students put on those documents will determine their eligibility for financial aid. And we also offer, probably to high school students alone, there are approximately 60 or 70 scholarships that will cover the cost of tuition and fees here. Our Honors Academy, where we have some very specific relationships with some private four-year institutions where a student could get a full scholarship here at Prince George and maintain that scholarship as long as they are performing academically and then we will work with them to apply to one of those six or seven institutions of their choice and they will receive full funding 
to get their bachelor's degree at those institutions. That's awesome. It is truly awesome, and we work very hard for those relationships for our students. Uh, we also have our Board of Trustees Legacy Award that will give a scholarship for one high school senior graduating from each of the Prince George's County Public Schools. And that has been supplemented this year by the Jerry and Kathy Wood Scholarship, which will give an additional scholarship to a graduating senior from the Prince George's County Public Schools. Schools. So we're very excited about those opportunities and our foundation provides us probably with another $250,000 worth of uh, support that we can dispense to students in need. Very aggressive. Prince George's Community College is very aggressive about keeping our young people Home. We Well, we want to keep them home, but more importantly, we want them to understand that education, post-secondary opportunities are available for anyone and everyone who wants to pursue their dream from that perspective. One thing that I learned as a parent who has a child who started in community college is that you can actually major, have a major, come out with an associate's degree in a two-year college as opposed to in a four-year college most people think well all you're taking is your English courses, your you know your math courses but you're not in your major until your junior year but here you get an associate's degree. Talk about that a little bit, how, th how different the two years could possibly be. Well, the two years may be different depending on what it is that you wish to pursue. If you're in a general studies program with some of the earlier options that I spoke about, then you really are laying the foundation to move on to that four-year institution where you're going to really immerse yourself in your major. If you are enrolled in one of our career programs, then you really are getting hands-on kind of learning, uh, participating in cooperative education experiences or internships that will really give you the skills you need to move out into the world of work and be ready to work almost your first day on, on, and within that particular employment field. For instance, things like forensics, uh, engineering technology, uh, hospitality and tourism. You know, we received a $1 million grant from uh, Gaylord, and you know they're moving into National Harbor, and they were very generous in working with the community college and the county to ensure that we will have a cadre of people who are ready to be employed in the hospitality industry. So we were able to create and expand some programs in hospitality, tourism, events planning, lodging. So we're very excited about that. We're also having conversations with other uh, business giants who are considering moving into the county so that we can make sure that we're offering programs that will meet their employment needs as well. You are not a stranger to Prince George's Community College. You've been here for years and as uh, Vice President of Student Services. Well, yes. And now you're President. What's your mission? What's, what's your goal in this new role? Well, you know, our mission is always focused on student success, how we can make sure that when students come here or as they look at all of the choices that they have in this day and age when it comes to post-secondary opportunities, that they'll consider Prince George's Community College either one of their top choices or the top choice. And the reason for that is because we truly have small classes. Our classes generally are no more than 25 to 30 students in a classroom taught by qualified faculty, uh, the majority of whom have doctorates and have worked in their field of expertise. They are here to teach. They're not required to publish, they, so we don't have that sort of publish or peril rule here at community colleges, but they're very much engaged in their discipline and making sure that they're always on top of what is happening that's new, exciting, innovative, and creative in the field. We also have a cadre of support services for students. Uh, we have the Upward Bound program, and that's a partnership that we have with the Prince George's County Public Schools. Uh, we have uh, been the host for for the Prince George's County Science Fair for more than 20 years. We've also hosted the College Fair for more than 20 years. So we have a number of partnerships with the public schools, the resident teacher program. I could go on and on and on about our commitment. So it's about quality faculty, it's about outstanding programs, and it really is about successful graduates. And I'll name a few, uh, uh, Judge Missouri, and Judge Teresa Nolan, both of whom are graduates of Prince George's Community College. Genuine, 
uh, the uh, singing artist, is a graduate of Prince George's <laughs> Community College. Michael Weiss, the Olympic uh, skating star, a graduate of Prince George's Community College. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Lisa, Lisa Satterwhite, who was, uh, for us, one of our first Truman Scholars, and there have only been very few community college students who've gained that, uh, who've had the opportunity to receive that kind of award, graduated from Prince George's Community College. We, this past year, we graduated more than 800 students with more than 900 associate degrees and certificates, so that uh, we believe that we are a critical a critical piece in the fabric of Prince George's County and that we contribute mightily to the economic vitality of the area through our graduates. So now all they need to do is get that fast perform in and, and, and apply. <laughs> and apply and it's also important to recognize that for us the deadlines are the same as they are for any other institution. If you're interested in coming to school while well, we will accept students both in the fall of the year and our classes generally begin around the end of August, the spring of the year and they generally begin around uh, the mid to late January, it is always important to understand that there are deadlines when it comes to financial aid. The earlier you apply, the more complete your forms are, the less anxiety you will have when school is almost ready to start because you will know what your financial aid package is and how well we can support you financially. It's also important to get good grades in school to make sure that uh, if you're interested in pursuing some sort of post-secondary education that you're focused on that. Good grades is what makes you eligible for some of the scholarships that I talked about. But in addition to that, through our workforce development uh, program, we also, through one of our centers down in Camp Springs, we just opened this past uh, April, the Skill Trade Center. So we are also working with young people who want to be drywall experts, who want to work with with uh, HVAC, heating and air conditioning, uh, who want to uh, be electricians. We're, we have relationships with some of the, uh, the locals so that if they're looking at apprenticeship kinds of programs. So we're really trying to make sure that we respond to the total spectrum of uh, potential uh, employment in Prince George's County and the region. You got your 50th year anniversary coming up? Yes, we do. And as we conclude uh, this, I certainly wanted to say that we're uh, ready to embark on our 50th anniversary where we are celebrating uh, providing 50 years of educational service and opportunity to the residents of the county. You know, the college was incepted in 1958 and we began at Suitland High School. We moved to this location at the corner of Route 202 and Campus Way South in the early 60s. And uh, we have served more than 500,000 different individuals through this institution. We have uh, 250 full-time faculty who have been very committed to the work that they do here to ensure that people leave here and they're leaving here with the kinds of skills and capabilities that are so necessary in this new market and this e new economy. Again, a big thank you to Dr. Charlene Dukes, president of Prince George's Community College. Later on, don't forget, we're going to talk to one of the students who graduated from Prince George's County Public Schools and who is now about to graduate from Prince George's Community College. One of the things that, that, that we talked about, and, and Dr. Dukes talked about it too, was how a lot of the community colleges have the relationship with the yes. four-year schools where after the two-year associate's degree, you roll right into the Howards, the, the Morgans. Does Towson, is Towson a part of that? Towson is actually part of the University System of Maryland, which has an agreement with the community colleges in the state. So pretty much any community college that you go to in the state, we have an articulation agreement with that community college. And that means you, you get your grades, you get your degree, and then Towson does what? Does it mean that you automatically get into Towson or you still have to? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically get into Towson. What it means is that if you have taken the correct courses, all of those courses will transfer with a max of 64 from the community college. Um, in addition to that, there are 
still a possibility that you may have to take a few courses to complete the gen ed program at the university. But overall, you should be on your way to a degree and completed pretty much a majority of your general education requirements. And that's a four year, you're on your way to a four year degree. Right, and if you get your AA degree from the community college and you don't do any work after it that causes you to have a bad academic reflection, then yes, you are guaranteed admission directly from the community college with the AA degree. And I think, it, and I like it because you've spent your two years and you just don't end up with just credits, but you know, if you have a situation where a student says, and we don't want this to happen after two years, I don't want to do this, I want to you still have an associate's degree. Right. Mm -hmm. You still have that degree. Let's get back on our calendar now and make sure that everybody is where they're supposed to be. Um, you talked about December 1st, why this calendar is so important. You said that December 1st is the scholarship deadline. Yes, it is. Talk about that. Well, it's December 1st at Towson, but it varies at every school. Sometimes you have multiple deadlines, and not to go too deep into it, but you always need to communicate with the school that you're applying to because various schools have different deadlines, such as the early decision deadline. If you apply during that time frame and you're admitted, you are bound to go to that school. Okay, so you pretty much giving them your word that if you accept me during this time frame, then I am going to your school and I will cancel my applications at the other schools. And you pay a fee for that? Yes. Now, well, we I saw a couple two hundred fifty dollars somebody paid for early decision to say, okay, I'm paying my two hundred fifty. I'm saying. So what would basically happen is they lose the two fifty if they backed out on the early decision agreement. Well, if they back out on the early decision agreement, they could lose whatever money they've already paid. Plus, they could be held liable for breaking a contract. With really? The yes. It's a contract that you agree with the school that you are going to that school. That's why they accepted you during that time frame. And that kept, and you kept somebody else from getting right. a, a spot. So if you're not sure of exactly what school you want to go to, you just want to apply and see where you're accepted and where you're not, then you should go with their regular admission deadlines. But the December 1st deadline that I mentioned before is a deadline at Towson, whereas those students wishing to be considered for admission and scholarship at the same time need to apply by December first not December 2nd not December 3rd but December 1st now other schools will have a similar deadline that your information has to be into the school by a certain date to be considered for admission or scholarship whereas the regular admission probably won't be until February March depending on the school that you're applying to and that's the early admissions um, deadline it's called different things at different schools or different terms are used um, pretty much at Towson it's our priority deadline students wish to be considered for admission and scholarship and then we have our regular deadline which is February 15th and then depending on what school you go to they have other deadlines such as early decision early action which means if you apply to, by a certain date you'll be notified whether you're admitted or not by a certain date and then you have the regular admission and also determines if a school is rolling admission if not rolling admission and basically rolling admission is we admit from October 1st up until the point where the class is full. Mm. Um, and that's before the February 15th deadline, after the February 15th deadline. It doesn't matter about the deadline. It's whenever the class fills up. Terry, what are we telling students about um, these early admissions uh, deadlines? Is, do you recommend early admissions? Well, the prof uh, it depends if students really know where they would like to attend college. Um, they should go talk to their professional school counselors in each high school and help them to assist them with making that decision. Talk to their parents. If they are definite about particular colleges that they want to attend, then they should apply for those early admissions. If they're not sure and they don't want to break a contract like Brian stated, then they may just want to wait for the regular admission. Because I'm sure a lot of people are under the impression that if you decide, oh, no, I don't want to go here, all you lose is the $250 right. or whatever it cost when you had to make that contract saying yes I'm gonna go to this particular school so let's get back on our calendar now so for the early admissions uh, September October you decide oh these are the colleges I want to go to you pick your five colleges uh, by November by November you should begin to narrow down what colleges you want to apply to look at the registration deadlines if you want to apply for early admissions and um, begin to, if that's what you want to apply, make sure you meet those deadlines, but begin to narrow down for those particular schools that you want to really start thinking seriously, seriously about um, registering for. And you need to be getting your, what about the recommendation letters and all of that? How soon right. did you get your recommendation letters for your daughter? We actually started over the summer because we figured the teachers and the counselors 
would have more time to devote to it, something like that rather than in the school year. So we tried to get most of ours by um, the time that school started. And make sure so. you get somebody who's going to say something nice about you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because, no, but really. Absolutely. Because, yeah, because you don't see those. Right. You yeah. don't see those recommendations. You, by law, they don't get to see, correct. you know, what somebody's writing, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much correct. You know, and so that's like blind recommendations going out. But, yeah, you know, but it, to me, if a person or a teacher agrees to do a recommendation, and typically you ask someone that you think will do a good recommendation. And if teachers don't feel they can do one, um, they're pretty honest and they'll tell you maybe you might want to select someone else. Oh, that's nice. That's, right. that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know enough about you. Not that they can't write a good one, right. but maybe they may feel that there's someone else that could write a better recommendation for you. So, I, so November, December, the application should be in the mail? Yes. 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 Absolutely. December, uh, students should really begin to get um, get those financial aid forms. Mm -hmm. They can't apply for, uh, for the financial aid until after January 1st, but they should really start getting their documents together, having their parents uh, get their tax forms and every all the documents that they would need to fill out those financial aid forms. As a matter of fact, they can get assistance from their school counselor to help them with getting those forms filled out. Um, Prince George's County Public Schools, uh, all kinds of um, what the different locations that opened up to assist parents. Talk about that, the different locations and things that you have to we assist have the a, parents. We have a Largo Scholarship and Financial Aid Center, which is a free resource that will assist students and parents to research different scholarships, to research colleges, to assist students with uh, filling out the financial aid form, to um, help them write essays to uh, go over those essays, make sure they make sense, that they're grammatically correct, and um, to, to help them to uh, with the scholarship and uh, college process. And to learn more about that, of course, you can visit our website at www.pgcps.org. And Terry, what are the, the hours of operation? We have two uh, scholarship centers. One is at Largo High School. And the hours of operation at the, the center at Largo High School is Wednesdays from 5.30 to 8.30, Saturdays from 9 to 1. And we also have a scholarship center at Crossland High School, which is open only on Saturdays from 9 to 1. And we encourage all of our students, and it's um, open to all Prince George's County Public School students, and again, it's free information and resources that they can come and access. Let's talk about money. Everybody wants to talk about money. Hmm. You know, um, like you said, students cannot fill out that FAFSA regardless of whether you think you can get money or you think you can't get money, whether it's a scholarship or whatever. They still have to fill out. The Absolutely. They have to fill out that financial aid form. And again, it's not, they can't um, submit it until after January 1st. If they want to apply for any scholarships, any state money, they have to make sure that they submit a financial aid form. Mm -hmm. And and you can do it online. Yes, you can do it on. They can fill it out online. And again, they need if they need assistance, their professional school counselors are available to help. Also, they can visit our financial aid scholarship centers, and they definitely will help them um, fill it out on the evenings and weekends. And this is for for grants, loans, scholarships. You cannot get a, a student loan without having that FAFSA form filled out. Absolutely. You can't get the state senatorial scholarships, any money from the school, without filling out those financial aid forms. Mm -hmm. And also, if you go to the U.S. Department of Education site, they have them in Spanish as well. Yes. They come in different languages, but you've got to wait until January 1. And people say, why do I have to wait? You have to wait because if you fill out anything prior to January 1, you are not filling it out for the fall of 2000. Eight. Correct. You would still be filling it out for the, the previous year. The oh, previous seven. year. Correct. We talked about too about college tours. When do we go on the college tours? Has your daughter gone already? Yes, she attended about three tours, but a, a major one happens um, each year in November, and she went last year. It's an HBCU college tour. Um, it uh, goes to about 11 historically black college and universities. They're gone for about seven days. Mm. And they pick a week where, it, in Prince George's County Public Schools, the kids are already out for like two teacher work days and there's a holiday. I think they go second week of November. Is it sorority? It's it's sorority? Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. It's Prince George's County Alumni Chapter. And they have it every year. And it grows and grows and grows every year. 
reasonable. Um, I think she went for less than $500. That was the bus, the hotel, two meals a day, and all the chaperones she needed. It was, it was great. So. Where can students learn more about um, the tours? If they wanted to go to the chapter website, it's um, pgcacdst.org. And on there, they'll have information about the HBCU College Tour. It sells out every year early, so um, usually school starts in August. By mid-September, it's full. Mm -hmm. So, and it's excellent. What? But there's another time on the calendar too, and as we count down to college, when young people, okay, December. Before we get to the college tours, let's talk about that month of January and when they fill out that FAFSA form. Okay. okay. So come January, we're in January now. What's the stretch from January to February? What's the deadline for getting that FAFSA form done? March the 30th is the deadline. So from January into March, they have the um, opportunity to fill out those financial aid forms. They need to make sure they get it in by that time period. But, <laughs> Brian, if they want some money, early come first come first serve right. so if you know that you're in dire financial need for college assistance then you need to have that FAFSA filled out New Year's Day first week of January it's not something that you really want to procrastinate because the majority of the money that's tied to helping students go to school is tied to that FAFSA it's first come first serve no matter how needy you are if you don't have it in early enough then we, most colleges won't be able to help you and what that FAFSA form does it really determines your family contribution, what your yeah. family yeah. is eligible to contribute to your education, to Correct. your, how much of your tuition can they pay. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that's what that form does, right? Yes. Okay. So, a college or a university will not even consider you for any money unless they have that eligible number, that contribution. What you're eligible for, what is it, the SR? The EFC, Expected Family Contribution. Mm -hmm. They can go anywhere from zero, zero, zero to nine, 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 nine. And the lower the number? The better. less the family can contribute. <laughs> the lower the number, the more money you will get. The more money you will get. The more money you're eligible to get. The more money you're eligible to get. And speaking of the money, because a lot of people say, we just can't afford it. Talk about that, the we can't afford it. Anybody can go to college in America who wants to go, can't they? Absolutely, yes. they can. There's money, there's scholarship money out there that our students need to research and look at what types of scholarships that are available. We have on our Prince George's County Public School website a scholarship directory, which tells, has a list of all scholarships that our students can apply for. Again, they can visit our Financial Aid Scholarship Center, and they can just go talk to their professional school counselor and get the assistance to research any scholarships and also make sure they meet those deadlines. Lines. That's extremely important. If it's after the deadline, they will not be um, included for that scholarship, possibly for getting the scholarship. And you should go to the, your high school counseling center. Absolutely. Definitely visit your counselor. That's what they're there for, to get assistance in researching scholarships and making sure they meet those deadlines and having those good essays that go along with those scholarship applications. So. You know, not to get into, you know, how much money you make or whatever, but when it comes to the whole financial part of this, what discussion have you had with, with your daughter? You know, some people say, oh, you could go to any college in America. You know, some people say no. Right. No, some parents say, no, no, no. You can get a college education, but we're going to keep some limits on this. And, and that's pretty much what we've discussed. We, at, at first, we were allowing her to select any college, and then we'd go back and look at some of the financial aspects. But my husband and I, we've said, this is an amount that we can feel that our family can contribute. Anything beyond that, you have to contribute. And she has to contribute via scholarships, um, grants, loans. Um, I'm one personally, I think students need to invest in their own college education because then they appreciate it more. When you have to pay for something, you appreciate it more. And maybe I'm a hard knocks parent, but she's gonna have I to like con that. she's gonna <laughs> have to contribute. My I, kind of mama. I can't write a I can't write a blank check and say go to Harvard or wherever you want. If you want to go to Harvard, I'll help you go there, but then we have to find the money together. Mm -hmm. So she has to participate. You know, uh, one, I was watching one of the financial shows, and, and I'll never forget this. And I think it was um, 
Rick Edelman who said this. He said that parents, I think, so if I'm wrong, Rick, forgive me. He said that only parents should really only contribute 35 percent to um, the young person's college education. What do, you, what do you think about that? I think it depends on the family. Um, the situation may be different from house A to house B. So it should be a decision that's made within the family of how much is going to be contributed to the education by the family and then by the student. You know, and some people, and it was also, um, it, parents were advised against taking second mortgages on your homes to pay for education. And we happen to have a parent who is in real estate, so you can address that too. How do you feel about that? Well, I personally would not take a second mortgage on my home to pay for anyone's, you know, education. Um, but one thing that my husband and I that we did several years ago, and this is quite honestly, we realized we didn't have enough money to pay for a college. So we started investing mm -hmm. in real estate and homes that you may have bought two years ago, there's some appreciation that we can tap to pay for her college. She doesn't know that, but that's She knows it now. <laughs> <laughs> that was our secret backup uh -huh. plan. Uh -huh. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know if 30% is the number. Or 35 or 40, yeah. yeah. I want to contribute enough where it's comfortable mm -hmm. and she doesn't have to work because that's the true. focus wow. is getting the grades. I don't, I'm, you know, being in school and getting an education, I don't want her to suffer with, I've got to come up with this money during college because it, it should be a happy, good time and if you've done your homework you get there and everything's paid for and you can relax. Let's get back on our calendar, let's stay on track. Now by Thanksgiving, by Turkey Day, all the applications, these are your admissions applications. Really the school that you're serious about that you know you want to apply for a scholarship for that school by Thanksgiving your application should be in the mail so you can meet whatever deadline. But again, stay in communication with the school that you're considering. All schools have different dates. It may be before Turkey Day, it may be after Turkey Day, but you have to stay in communication with your schools that you're considering. And Stephanie was talking about the money and how much you contribute and, and to make sure that your young person can go to school in the fall. You can go to college. Do not sit back and say, I can't afford this, or my parents make too much money, or we make too much. Don't say that. Isn't that one of the biggest mistakes people make? Yes, it is. They don't. They say they, they think they can't afford going to college. They don't fill out those financial aid forms. They don't research and look for, get, try to get help to um, have their children fill out those scholarship applications. So they just sit home and they just do nothing. So we want to definitely avoid our students from doing that. And students should understand, too, that, yes, you fill out the application to get into the college or university to be accepted, but also they have, um, I remember for my son, then you would get another form that you, the school may have its own financial aid Depending application along to. with the FAFSA that you Correct. need to fill out. So what do you need to do? Depending on the school that you're applying to, there may be a separate um, financial aid application which must be filled out in addition to the FAFSA and submit it. It takes a closer look at your family income, what you're spending, what you're bringing in to determine what exactly you're eligible for outside of the federal guidelines. Another thing I would like to stress that going to college does not completely fall all on the student. A lot of families will say, oh well it's my child that wants to go to college so my information is not part of that. The parent's information is part of whether the child will or will not go to college because the financial income for the child because they are still considered a dependent by federal government up to, I think, like the age of 24. 24. 24. So if your child is under 24, they need your information to go to school regardless of what you think about it. And that's so important yeah. because a lot of students do not have that support. And parents aren't willing, some parents aren't willing to like, and the information that we're talking about, we need, the student needs your tax information, the information yes. from your W-2 form, yes. your financial information yes. is what the uh, government is going to use to determine how much money can be contributed, right? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, did you have all of those papers and everything together or you knew? We got them together and it was, um, an eye-opener for my daughter because that's the first time when she got to get access to that information to know so and what okay for parents so what's your advice for parents for getting the information together now what, what do they need I start collecting things like I've already started collecting things that I will need for the FAFSA um, I may not have my um, 
tax forms by the time the deadlines are due. So I'll, I've, I have my um, end of the year pay stub. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, bank accounts, investment information, things like that. It, things that I collect anyway for uh, tax purposes. Mm -hmm. last it's just that I've started in last year's tax returns. We'll I've just also. started getting it together earlier because you know now where I normally file my taxes April fifteenth, mm -hmm. I might have to do it January you know thirtieth or something for purposes of um, having all the information for FAFSA. And so. I found is did you do it online? The fast. I haven't actually had to complete it yet, right, okay. but I do plan to do it online. Uh, they say it's easier, yes. and you can make corrections and mm -hmm. things like that. I'll Let's use technology. Right. And, right. You get a pin number. It's better to right. use to do it online because if you make a mistake and it's online before they let you sign off on it. I remember this right. before they let you sign off that they will tell you you've got this mistake or you okay. duplicated this. Check this. Where in? If you do it by hand, there's no way to be able to check yeah. it. There's nobody, no way to check it, and by the time they send back to you, it could take a whole six weeks to eight weeks by the time they send you a letter back saying that you made a mistake. You're right, Robin. Looking That's at the right. time frame with the FAFSA online compared to the paper version, um, you could be looking at weeks before the paper version is processed, whereas the online version could be processed maybe in under a week because technology has made it so that colleges want you to apply online. FAFSA wants you to apply online, and online is really the way to go when you're looking at being eligible for money, the time frame, and meeting deadlines. And that's important because by the time you send all that paper back and forth and, and you've made a mistake, you've missed you've valuable missed. time that right. could count you out of valuable dollars that could help contribute to your education. Um, as Terry mentioned before, one thing that parents must do, and students also, to do the FAFSA online, they should go online now and apply for that PIN, and that's your electronic signature, and you can do that at the FAFSA website. And let's talk about that electronic signature and what exactly what that is. All you're doing is, is your electronic signature is allowing you to, to sign that application. With that number that they With assigned you. That special number that they assigned you. So you're saying that they can go now? and get the um, electronic pen? They actually should it? be going now to get the pen. The pen takes a couple of days to get to you, but you want to make sure that you have that pen so when January 1st rolls around and you've done all your New Year party and everything, and you're ready to do that fast, but you have that pen number and you can go in and sign your application that day and not have to wait because again, deadlines and time frames. Are Every day that you lose is a day that you may not get the money that you need to go to school. But now, Robin, we want to make sure our audience uh, remembers that they cannot send that financial aid form until after January Correct. 1st. The FAFSA cannot go. For young people who want to go to school in the fall, the FAFSA form cannot be filled out until after January 1st. Um, and I wanted to talk more, too, about the um, the electronic pen. There, there was a point I wanted to make about, about that um, electronic pen. What's going to happen? This is what it is. What's going to happen? If you have not applied for that electronic pen already ahead of time, what happens after January 1, when you fill out that application, you know, they will say to you, okay, here you can apply for your electronic pen for the future, but right now you can print out the signature page. You sign that signature page and then you mail it in. And you're still losing valuable days that could count you out of valuable dollars for your education. Now, you, you do know, though, you do save a little time because you do know that you're right, that that um, application you put in, that FAFSA form that you put in, that the information is correct. But the, you, they're still waiting for your, it does, all your information doesn't go and get processed right away because they're still waiting for that signature page. And if I did the FAFSA and I didn't have my pen, before I mailed in the signature page, I would apply for a pen, and it will probably be a lot faster. And we need two pens. Tell them the pens that we need now, your <laughs> pen and your parents', parents pen. pen. Right. Yes. Because both the parent and the student, because it's the parent's financial information. Okay. Right, and it is required. Mm-hmm. I'm loving it. We're counting down to college. All our young people are going to be in college in the fall. You have no excuse. You're getting all the information that you need right here, and please make sure you visit our website at www.pgcps.org. We've got our college um, page for you, our scholarship page. Terry, we're, uh, January's gone. We've, we've done it. We've filled out the FAFSA. 
What should young people be doing in February? Well, applications should have been submitted and they should be receiving admit, uh, acceptance letters back. This is the early admission this stuff? Is, this is regular admission if they've applied early. And then, I'm sorry, I said regular admission. This is <laughs> early admission. And then they should have uh, st begin to apply for uh, regular admission. Also, Ms. Ireland mentioned about um, college tours. And if parents can't afford the organized college tours, through uh, sororities and universities, they can begin to take their children through to the colleges on their own. Um, on their own. Yes. That they've selected. Yes. yes. That they selected. Yes. And, and what is that? Basically contacting the college? It's contacting the colleges to find out what they have available. We have college tours which are available sometimes seven days a week, five days a week, six days a week. Communicate with the school that you're interested in. You can learn the information online or over the phone. But they also have, in addition to the campus tours, open house. And open house is pretty much at any college an all-day event where you're exposed to every aspect of the college that you would possibly need to in order to determine is this the right school for me. I'm talking admissions, financial aid, housing and residence life, professors, majors, um, also students that go to school there. So it's a very informative day. So that's the early, that's the early tour that you were talking about where they do in like August or September. And well it's they not necessarily the early tour but each college pretty much will have a what is a showcase of their mm -hmm. college for the day. Some universities will have it once a semester, some will have it five times a semester. So you always have to communicate with the school that you're looking at to find out when their open house days are, when their campus tours are. Um, most of them fill out very quickly, so go online or And the open house the is more for like, come on, let me show you what we offer. Right. Right. So, right. and then if you like it, then you apply. Right. And then after you're accepted, then that's when you go back and go on a tour and see exactly Well, you don't necessarily what? have to go back. If you feel comfortable with your decision, this is the school that you want to go to and you want to commit to that school. If you visited that school and you feel comfortable with your visit, you don't want to take a second look, because some families do want to take a second look or call before they go, that's fine. Um, but it's really, when do you feel comfortable with your decision of, is this the right school for me? March. What's happening in March? Financial aid. Financial aid Money. forms. Money. <laughs> Financial aid March forms Madness. should have been <laughs> submitted. Scholarship um, deadlines are closing in, so all scholarship applications should have been submitted. And they're just sitting back waiting to see how much, how money. much money yeah. and where they're going to be accepted. Mm. So generally, you should be checking your mail in March because nine times out of ten, a school is going to say you have offered this scholarship or this is your financial aid package. A lot of students they feel, oh, well, the school is still sending me junk mail. I get a letter from this school. I'll read that later. So what happened after <laughs> school today? Whereas that could have been a letter stating you've been awarded this scholarship. You oh. need to reply by this date, or this is your financial aid package. You need to reply by this date in order for it to be solidified. Mm -hmm. So you got all your stuff together. It's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> it is a process. What's it, what, what advice do you want to give to parents, though? I mean, because this is your first child going to college. Right. I mean, how are you feeling about all this? Nervous, excited. Um, advice I would have to say is start early. Yes. I'm a planner, and if I start early, it alleviates the stress for me. So we try to keep schedules and budgets, and we try to... Um, budget our time and just like you know you say you're going to do these things each week we make reading college applications um, information we make it a part of our weekly schedule Sunday night we sit down we go through what we have to do for the week we're going to spend three hours on Wednesday looking at scholarships we have this application that's going to be due in a week or two and we have to review things so we, we, we try to plan yes. and we start that early we started in July well actually important. we started before July but we started early. And that's tremendous support mm -hmm. for a student to have, you know. Correct. But a lot of students don't have parents who have the time to do it, who have the know-how, the knowledge, and hopefully that we're giving parents and students um, some information that's truly needed to help these young people get into college in the fall. But for students who don't have that kind of support, you know, from parents or whatever. Well, Terry, what can they do? Where can they go? That's why we have uh, professional school counselors in every high school. But if the students don't have that support, they can go to their counselors to assist them, helping them get an organized, helping them apply to those colleges, apply for those scholarships, meeting deadlines, looking at deadlines, making sure they're meeting deadlines. So they can actually come, so a student can actually come 
to the, the uh, school counseling office and work with their designated professional school counselor. And the, they will help them fill out the application. They will they help will them through them. the whole entire process. And then they can, that way, they can go home and advise their parents and say, oh, mom, dad, I need you to do this, or I need this piece Absolutely. of paper, or that piece. That's awesome. Yes, they can. That's awesome. Yes, it is. Like Mrs. Ireland said, it's a very, it can be very stressful. Yeah. And some yes. parents, um, we have parents that work full time. They don't have all the time to put into assisting their students, even if they want to. So they can definitely go into the schools and have those counselors assist them with the whole entire process. And we partner with parents. I have a group of parents. Our kids are generally interested in some of the same schools and if you're going on a trip down to Hampton maybe my daughter goes with you mm -hmm. and so we trade off yeah. and That's and share true. some of the responsibilities mm -hmm. and keep each other reminded of deadlines and things like that you have to work together and it makes it a little bit easier That's right. and a lot of parents it, I mean it is is frightening and and you know like for parents this is the first time but also we have a lot of Hispanic parents um, yes. who may yes. not speak English or whatever, that's why we offer Countdown to College. It's going to come on right after this show. It comes on in Spanish, the same information, the FAFSA form, the applications, because we want our Hispanic uh, students and parents to know, too, we want everybody Absolutely. to go to college. Absolutely. And the colleges want them to know as well. So most colleges are willing to translate the information in Spanish if it has not already been translated in Spanish. So if you're not comfortable with the English version, you can always call the college. Is it available in Spanish? And if it is, they'll make it available to you. Really? Yes. Really? So the Towson application um, is available in Spanish? The Towson application may not be available in Spanish, but a lot of our publications for our parents are translated oh. into Spanish because the students are able to understand the English language on the application. Now, if a person, if a student parent is interested in Towson, which, what's your web address or what, contact information? The web address for Towson is www.discover.towson.edu. They can also look us up on our main page, www.towson.edu, or 410-704-2113. Okay, we will put that information up for you again. You know, we talked about um, the students, and we talked about four-year universities, and we talked about... Um, the community colleges. Yeah. Well, we have a young person, Randall Pike, our reporter Randall Pike, um, talked with a young person who graduated from Prince George's County Public Schools and who's now about to graduate from Prince George's Community College. So let's check in with Randy. When a senior in high school earns their degree, some of them will be heading towards a four-year university anticipating life after high school away from home while others attend community college, what some may deem a demotion or a setback. I caught up with Bethel Solomon, a student at Prince George's Community College, who had this feeling at first, but dispelled that notion with nothing but positive comments and insight about the two-year institution. There were a lot of things I was skeptic about. I felt the same way a lot of other students did about community colleges, that they're downplayed and it's not a real school and it's not as accredited. It's just as accredited as any other four-year college, really. And it focuses more on the student and the classroom sizes are a lot smaller. The teacher can actually focus with me more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I used to have like a big issue with math and there are a lot of math, like, tutoring centers on this campus and there are teachers like teachers of mine that I've had that will actually be in the tutoring center that will help you after class so that you can achieve not just to pass the class but to actually understand what's going on there's writing tutoring centers there's a computer lab that's open till 10 p.m. at night like they work with your schedule because they know a lot of students work and have other priorities with their family or whatever else they may be into I would say for your first two years it's best to go to a community college it prepares you for the real world, you feel like you're actually ready to go into the actual college scene. It's a smaller campus, but it still can handle helping you out with your classes and understanding how it is to work in the real world. And I really advise if you're not ready to move away and don't want to spend so much money, I really advise going to community college your first two years. I've just had a really great time at PG and I wish good luck to any incoming students. From Channel 96 on Comcast and 38 on Verizon, this is Randall Pike reporting. Prince George's Community College, thank you so much. I mean, they have contributed so much to the Countdown to College show, and we just love it. That young woman now going on to a four-year program, and she's um, in art. 
you know, maybe fashion design or interior design. Right. But wonderful. isn't it wonderful? wonderful? I mean, and so you can do. Yes. yes. Everybody's not going to be ready for the whole four-year experience right away, and, and, and it might be a bit much for them. Right. So the two-year program at some money. yeah, and, oh, and it definitely saves some money. Um, it saves some money as yes. well. Now let's talk about April. We're April now, right? April on our countdown to college calendar. Okay. What should be going on in April? April, you should be gathering your admissions decisions. What school am I accepted to? What schools I'm not accepted to? What schools need additional information to determine um, where I'm accepted at? And you can pretty much start doing this as soon as you find out each school that you're admitted to and which school needs additional information. But somewhere around April, you need to be narrowing down to one school that you're actually going to enroll in, communicate with that school about the enrollment fee. Some schools do charge a fee to enroll at the college or university. Um, sometimes it's a deposit that has to be made to enroll at a college or a university. The fee goes towards enrollment processing you don't see that money again a deposit it's just that a deposit you'll see that money maybe on the fall tuition bill It'll as a be credit as or a credit. the spring mm -hmm. tuition bill as a credit so you need to find out if that fee or deposit has to be paid right then and there can it be deferred until the school year starts when your financial aid will be able to cover that fee as well because a lot of schools they have the means to enroll but they don't have the financial means to enroll right then and there and some schools will be willing to take your contract without the fee they'll just defer that fee until the financial aid kicks in for the fall that you're enrolled because they have the packet so they already know how much money when you're eligible for because you did everything on time awarded. nice and early <laughs> right. so and that's another reason mm -hmm why you want to get this stuff done early mm -hmm. so the school can have all of your information so you can say you know I really don't have all the money but look I'm coming I'm right. coming and look at all the money I mean you've already told waiting. me what my package is right you know so it's time to let schools know April is your time to let schools know this is where I'm going I'm coming t I'm coming to you what happens in May well, May, you should really begin to look at your budget to see what you actually can afford with all of your scholarship monies, your financial aid, and what schools you're really interested in to have the um, majors that you want to study in. So you should really know by then what schools that you want to um, attend. Also, I want to put in a, a shameless little plug for our scholarship centers that those students that visit the scholarship center will earn a book scholarship. We know how expensive books are, mm -hmm. so we have a donations made from a real estate company that um, will give book scholarships to students that have visited our scholarship center during the year. That's wonderful. Okay, now let's give the locations of the scholarship centers again and the times. The scholarship centers are located at Largo High School. On, they're open on Wednesdays from 5.30 to 8.30 and Saturdays from 9 to 1. It's also um, available at Crossland High School on Saturdays from 9 to 1. Mm -hmm. And you can find out more about that by visiting us on the web at www.pgcps.org. And the telephone number, or if they want to call? If they want to call, they can call me. The telephone number is 301-567-8670. That's 301-567-8670. June. It's June. Make, but you know what? <laughs> Remember this, too. Because, you know, people get so excited. I'm excited. I love college. I love <laughs> Thomas. Look, and I've got one who's in graduate school, okay? Ah, thank you. I got one in graduate school, and I got one going to ninth grade. But. People get so excited. These students get so excited about going to college. You've done the applications and all of that. One thing, make sure you pass 12th grade. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> and make sure you do well in 12th grade Absolutely. also, Robin, because while you may pass 12th grade, schools are still looking at your final transcript. You still have to submit that final documentation saying that I did graduate from 12th grade. And depending on your grades, a school can revoke the offer of admission. Can they? Yes, a school can revoke your offer of admission. If they're not satisfied with your senior year work, if you had to maintain a certain GPA, or if you were on some probationary status of admission and you didn't fulfill that agreement, then they can revoke your offer of admission. And it really can impact your money. Right. Absolutely. Yes. The scholarship money. Then you have to start all over again, and you have three months to go. And July and August, Mom, what should you be doing? They should be working to gain some money <laughs> to help pay for, you know, 
<laughs> pay for their incidentals once they get in school or and to pay for their mail. tuition. Check your mail, especially yeah. if it's a school that you determine I'm coming to your school. There's no fluff mail coming at that point. They're sending you registration information, overnight information, orientation information, enrollment Dorm information. information. Yes, yeah, financial aid information. Mm -hmm. So check your mail. Every school has a different policy. And understand that while one child that's going to one school may be doing this in the summer and your child is not, it doesn't necessarily mean that the school has messed up, but all schools have different procedures over the summer for enrollment. Uh -huh. We get a lot of phone calls. Well, my daughter that went to so-and-so, she got this and she got that, but we haven't received anything from Towson yet. Understand we have different procedures. Mm -hmm. And some young people in some colleges have um, programs summer programs for the freshmen, those yeah. orientation yeah. programs yeah. for the freshmen to come for six weeks or whatever, yeah. so by mm -hmm. the time that they get there, they're already situated and, mm -hmm. you know, they fit right in. <laughs> and, you know, the help will be more successful. I'm right. excited. Right. I'm need to go back. <laughs> well, this is an exciting process, mm -hmm. so it's very important and to assist students in helping them walk through the whole entire process. Mm -hmm. What's the final thing that you want to say to parents? Be early and be patient. Understand it is a process. It does not happen overnight. Communicate with the schools. Anything that you're not sure about, just like you can call Terry's office, you can call the colleges or universities that you're considering, and they'll walk you through it over the phone. So be patient. Check your should dot your I's, cross your T's and everything, and make sure that you are staying in communication with the schools to make sure that you submitted the proper documentation by the certain deadlines. We have a new initiative in Prince George's County where our counselors are conducting individual learning plans on all of our students from pre-K to 12th grade. And this is to ensure that our students have plans, early plans about what their careers and what their interests are. It's a running record to make sure from year to re year our students have identified um, appropriate courses or parents are assisting with identifying appropriate courses so our students are ready and prepared to go on to college and beyond. And remember, at Prince George's County Public Schools, this is where we say any student, and we believe the board and our superintendent, the staff, we all believe that any student who wants to go to college can go to college. Final words, Mom? Just uh, stand by your students, work with them, and realize it's stressful for them as well. So try to be a reassuring voice to, to kind of help them through the process. And my final words, you teach them how to wash. This summer, they need to learn how to wash clothes. <laughs> <laughs> they need to learn how to wash the clothes. Don't pay more. That's right. They need to learn how to iron a little bit, and they need to learn how to cook. You know, they got instant oatmeal and all of that no, good stuff. they got stuff. the dorm and the housing and the dining hall. And right. they, yeah, freshman 15, right. freshman 25. Yeah, that's right. They had good food. Right. They had good food in the dining hall. But you're going off, and you're going to have a great time, and we just say, oh. We're so happy for you. We're so proud of you. And for all of you out there, thank you so much for watching Countdown to College. And if you need more information, please visit us on the web at www.pgcps.org. Everybody's going to college in the fall, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yay. Yes, That's are. right. <laughs>